This is the end of uh, the Mockingjay, uh, the, the Hunger Games uh, saga, which I have to say up until now has given me many hours of very, very rewarding cinema viewing. I like Hunger Games very much. I like the story. I like the idea. I remember going to see the first Hunger Games movie in Boston on, in a midnight screening. Boston in Lincolnshire? But no, Boston in America. They've got, they got a midnight screening. They have, yeah. Right, but it wasn't that Boston. Okay, it was right. Boston in America. In fact, I did the broadcast for the next day, having seen it at the 12 o'clock screening, and thinking, wow, this is really something else. This is partly because... As you remember, there was all that difficulty at the time when they first made it, where they're going to be able to make it, we get a certificate, meant that, that younger viewers could go and see it because it was dealing with very, very tough subject matter. I mean, it was basically Battle Royale. Um, and uh, I thought it delivered terrifically well. So we now finally get to the final instalment, which is the second part of Mockingjay, which is cut in two. And the first part of Mockingjay uh, was very talky. There was sort of lots of exposition, certain amount of action sequence, but it was it was necessarily very very discursive. Uh, this picks up exactly where the first one uh, left off. Uh, there's, I, there's really no point attempting to do a plot synopsis because the fact of the matter is, if you're if you're not up to speed with with the Mockingjay plot, you, there's 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 no point. Okay, so it picks up exactly where the previous instalment left off. We are moving toward the final conflict. We are moving toward you know the forces of you may be able to say light and dark meeting, but of course, actually one of the things that the whole story has been building towards is that these things are often indistinguishable. Katniss Everdeen, as played still brilliantly, still Girl on Fire um, by Jennifer Lawrence, uh, has decided that she doesn't want to be just some figurehead. What she wants to do is actually be the person who is leading, who is leading the fight for liberation. And this is something which doesn't necessarily go down particularly well with Alma Coyne, played by Julianne Moore, who looks less and less like a liberator and more like an ice queen in waiting. Here's a clip. Put her on the first hovercraft back. That'd be ridiculous. She can't come back now. She's mythic. Couldn't have staged it better myself. Hmm. No. She's going to stay where she is. And whatever she's doing, we conceived it. It was our plan all along. Of course it was. Mr. Heavensby, you're the game maker. I want everyone to know whatever game she's playing. She's playing it for us. There are so many things to like about The Hunger Game that it's almost inevitable that the final instalment was going to have a certain sense of, of anticlimax. Let's start with, with the good stuff. I think it's impressive that what the film has managed to do is to not sell out either its heroine or its darker underlying dystopian themes. There are some fairly complex ideas going on in the story which are to do with power and corruption and the difference between the way things are and the way things are presented. And during the course of the, of, of the Hunger Games saga, these ideas have been unpacked and investigated in a way which is very populist, very, very accessible, often, I think, uh, weird and strange, but done in a way which is you know, which makes sense. I, it reminds me, and I say this as a compliment, of how I felt about the Planet of the Apes series, that although there were some flaws in the Planet of the Apes series, it was still the thing that taught me about politics. And I know that I say that, that I, that's something that I repeat often. It sounds like a gag. I'm, I'm not kidding. There is a whole generation of people of my age who grew up watching the Planet of the Apes movies and learning about, you know, democracy and revolution and nuclear arms, all the rest of it, through those stories. And I think all that has managed to be kept. I also think that... Uh, Jennifer Lawrence continues to be terrific, surrounded by a supporting cast. Obviously, you know, the great loss of uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who is in the film. You said that when you first see him, you gasp to some extent. But if this is can't the wait, I suppose we we know that he's in the movie. Yeah. We know that he's passed away. But so when he's there and it's almost in the first scene, mm -hmm. uh, you go, oh, yeah. yes, of course. And it all comes back in your... I mean, uh, it, the in the interview last week, you and I just mentioned... Philip Seymour Hoffman right at the yeah, end of the yeah, interview, yeah. and then you could tell that Jennifer Lawrence still was well, of course, was very, of course. you know, was very upset. Yeah, of course, absolutely, and and, and uh, you know, understandably so. So all those things I think are you know, are in its favour. And if you if you've been to see the rest of the series, of course, you, you know, th there's no question about go you know go and see it because it 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 brings things to a conclusion. However, that said, 
I do think as far as a film is concerned, it's probably the weakest of all of them. That's not to say that the ideas in it aren't interesting, but as a piece of filmmaking, it's the weakest. I've said before that basically if the first film was Battle Royale and the second film was Rollerball and the third film was kind of broadcast news meets network, this is a little bit Quantum of Solace. Now, I know, again, that everyone's now saying that Quantum of Solace is the best Bond film and therefore it may well be that there's a whole backlash that then reassesses Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 as the best. I'm I've never a- met anyone who thinks Quantum of Solace oh, the, is the best. No, they're, well, you should spend more time on the internet amidst no. the glitter. No, <laughs> no actually, don't no, so. don't do that. Um, it has that same sense of a lot of stuff going on and a lot of stuff having to be covered. And again, like Quantum of Solace, picks up you know immediately after the previous action, but somehow being dramatically a little bit fudged. One of the things that was a strength of Mockingjay Part 1 was it absolutely made a virtue of being as discursive as it was. It was almost like everyone sitting down and discussing what it really meant to be selling a political idea as some kind of pre-packaged product. The problem with Hunger Games Part 2 is that it feels like a far less satisfactory marriage of discursive ideas and action sequences. There is a fairly bold attempt to bring the spirit of the games back to the battlefield by turning a battlefield into like a kind of game. So suddenly we get booby traps and then we get the kind of House of the Dead style mutts, you know, chasing around. And those are things which sort of refer back to the original. But what you do feel is... The, the the brutal gladiatorial edge that drove the first two films, Hunger Games and Catching Fire, has been lost. The edge that made those so so brilliant because they made in that kind of you know Running Man, Logan's Run, Rollerball, you know the great gladiatorial ideas ha- have gone, and what it's become is something which is wrestling with larger ideas, but having broken out of the confines of those simpler ideas, it's kind of lost its way to some extent. Now, having said all of that, I don't think for one minute it's a bad film. I think it's a very solid film. However, I think that if you're... I think there are diehard fans amongst whom I would count myself who will come out of it wishing for both more and less. And the less is that I think that, that the final film should have been one film. I think that when you look at what's happened now with the two films stuck together, and obviously, actually, as you said, because one of them picks up so clearly after where the other one has. You noticed that I now click my fingers rather than bang the table. It's a, it's well, it's an it's an improvement. I'm sorry, yes, it's a genuine attempt to stop banging the table. I'm really I'm so, sorry. I'm it's just, very jazzy and very sixty. It is very it's a yeah jazz. Um, actually, I think that it would have been better as one single film because what happens this time is that you do get the sense of something being spread rather too thin of something uh, at the s- simultaneously trying to do too much but having too little with which to do it so overall i think dramatically the balance between action and uh, discursiveness is feels a lot more forced this time there was a certain sense of pedestrianism which has never been the case before and certainly not in the first two films, when it was always, I mean, particularly the first one was very alarming in certain places. You have lost that. There are sequences in this that deal with very dark ideas, and it is a tribute to the, to the series, no pun intended, a tribute to the series that it's managed to keep its eye on those darker, more dystopian ideas. But I do think that as a film, it is probably, for me, in the end, the weakest of them.